In today's video, let's bring the dead back to life. Despite having a trilogy of movies that says that's probably a bad idea. Sort of like this bird that went extinct because of hats, and this long extinct human which if brought back to life would certainly cause a bit of controversy. The Heath Hen I for one believe that the poor Heath Hen should be one of the first extinct animals to be brought back from the dead, once numbering in the millions in habitats that spread from Maine all the way to the Carolinas. By 1870, there was only a single population left, which was found at Martha's Vineyard. Their population dwindled down to a mere 50 individuals, but conservation efforts saw them bounce back to around 2,000. However, in May 1916, a devastating wildfire swept through the Heath Hen breeding grounds. The following year, the annual census turned up only about 150 birds, and numbers just kept getting lower after that. The last of the hens, a male that was named Booming Ben, was last seen in March of 1932, and the species was declared extinct not long after. Being one of the many animals whose extinction was directly caused by man is not the only reason why the Heath Hen is a prime candidate for de-extinction. There's also a wide availability of DNA from specimens preserved in museums, which should make it easier for scientists to help the animal's genetic code. And once that's done, gene editing could be done to the Heath Hen's closest living relative, the North American Prairie Chicken, in order to bring this once bountiful bird back to life. The Quagga Here's an extinct animal that scientists not only want to bring back to life, they've actually started on it with very promising results. Overhunting have resulted in the extinction of the quagga in 1983, but in 1984, genealogy technology revealed that the quagga was actually a subspecies of the plain zebra, meaning it does have the same DNA. The two species share the same genotype, though their observable characteristics are far different. This now makes it easier for scientists to bring this once extinct animal back to life. The Quagga project was started to try to recreate the Quagga through artificial selection of plain zebras. The project has had some success. The first Quagga-like zebra foal was born in January of 2005, and the fifth generation foal was born in December of 2013. And according to the project's Facebook page, another foal was birthed in 2021. Scientists hope continued selective breeding will lead to the generations of plain zebras almost identical to the extinct Quagga, which would then be released into the wild. The Baiji River Dolphin The Baiji River Dolphin is such a beautiful animal. It was also called the Goddess of the Yanks River, which is the place where it lived for 20 million years. However, it also holds the unfortunate distinction of being the first dolphin species to be declared extinct in modern times. It went from a relatively healthy population of around 6,000 to be declared extinct in 2006. It all happened in just a few decades, which when compared to how long these animals have swam in the Yanks, it's just a blink of an eye. They are great candidates for de-extinction because of the fact that they've just been declared extinct relatively recently, and the large amount of DNA material for scientists to tinker with is widely available. Thing is though, even if they were brought back to life, which is theoretically possible with today's technology, they may not have a home to come back to. Habitat loss and pollution are pointed as the major reasons of this animal's extinction, and with the Yanks River being one of the most polluted bodies of water on Earth, it's highly unlikely that a population reintroduced to their natural habitat will flourish, much less survive. The Pyrenean Ibex The Pyrenean Ibex holds the unenviable distinction of going extinct not only once, but twice. For more than 200 years, they were hunted for sport and, of course, for meat, until the last of the Ibexes died in the year 2000. Scientists have been trying to bring them back from the dead ever since. Technically, they were de-extincted back over in 2006, but immediately went extinct again after a few minutes. Using genetic material from the frozen skin of the last Ibex, they were able to successfully produce a clone by creating embryos and implanting them in Spanish Ibexes. However, the clone had a deformed respiratory system, hence it lived only a few minutes after birth. Despite ending in failure, this marked the first ever successful attempt at de-extinction by way of cloning. With this success, you might think that it's now going to be a walk in the park bringing back extinct animals, just as long as scientists have some viable genetic material. Uh, not quite. You see, the success rate of cloning is extremely low. Out of the hundreds of embryos created and implanted into surrogates, only one made it to full term, and even this one had birth defects. But despite the difficulty, scientists are confident that they're going to be able to bring back the Pyrenean Ibex from extinction. It's only a matter of time at this point. The Dodo The Dodo is the poster child for any animal who's gone extinct relatively recently, and it seems only proper that they too become primary candidates for de-extinction. They evolved with no natural predators, but then the humans that arrived on their home island of Maratias decimated the entire population for food. 
The introduction of non-endemic animals to the island didn't help as well, adding more creatures that preyed on the flightless birds. For many years, bringing the dodo back from the dead seemed impossible, since no viable genetic material could be found. All that changed in 2007, though. In that year, scientists were able to unearth the best preserved dodo skeleton ever found, and they hope that this excellent specimen still holds genetic material other scientists can still work on. And they were right. In 2016, Beth Shapiro, an evolutionary biologist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, announced at the Plant and Animal Genomes Conference that the whole genome of the extinct dodo bird had been sequenced. This achievement made de-extinction possible for the dodo. The Megalania the Megalania was a giant monitor lizard that inhabited Australia during the Pleistocene era. This is the largest terrestrial lizard to have existed with 35 feet or more in length and weighed up to 8,300 pounds. They also have toxin excreting glands in their mouths, which means they were highly venomous. In other words, they're kind of like Komodo dragons, only much, much larger. This giant lizard is unique on this list because although the species is considered long extinct, some people actually think it's still out there. There have been sightings of Megalania reported as late as the 1970s. There's also this one telling of a surveyor who wanted nothing else but to sit on what he thought was a log on the side of the road. The log suddenly bolted away and it ended up being a lizard of 15 feet in length. Australian cryptozoologist Rex Gilroy is convinced that these creatures are still alive, prompting him to come up with quite a unique de-extinction method. He proposed that if somebody was to reconstruct the ecosystems that existed before the arrival of humans to Australia, the Megalania would once again flourish. A build it and they'll come sort of deal, but for monster lizards. The Carolina Parakeet Carolina parakeets are green-bodied birds made even more vibrant by their yellow heads and red faces. They once thrived between the U.S. East Coast and what is now Colorado, but was declared extinct when the last specimen held at the Cincinnati Zoo died in 1918. They were a fascinating species. They adapted to live off the toxic cockleburrs, which did not injure the birds, but often proved fatal for predators like cats. However, as soon as the European settlers arrived at the New World, their days were numbered. They were hunted to extinction not for food, but for vanity. They were so beautiful, they were hunted so that their feathers could adorn ladies' hats. Of course, this grave injustice should be enough reason for the Carolina parakeet to be a candidate for de-extinction on its own. Good news here is that they are, and the even better news is that scientists are well on their way to doing so. It was recently discovered that their DNA is very similar to that of their closest living relative, the sun parakeet. Today's technology is theoretically capable of altering the sun parakeet's DNA ever so slightly in order to produce a pure Carolina parakeet offspring. The process will be difficult, involving editing several hundred protein codes in the delicate strands that define life, but by the looks of it, we'll probably see these beautiful birds alive once again in a few years. The Gastric Brooding Frog The gastric brooding frogs were ground-dwelling frogs native to Queensland and eastern Australia. There were only two species of this frog, both of which became extinct in the mid-1980s. They are known for their reproductive methods, which is extremely unique. The mother would convert her stomach into a womb, swallow her eggs, refrain from eating during the six-week gestation period, and give birth vomiting the babies out. Currently, they're in the process of de-extinction under the Lazarus Project, named after a biblical character who was brought back to life. The project was established within the sole purpose of bringing these frogs back from extinction, and in recent years, they have come a pretty long way. In 2013, scientists at the University of New South Wales and the University of Newcastle tried to clone the frog by implanting a cell nucleus from a dead gastric brooding frog into a live egg. This live egg was from another frog species very similar. All attempts have failed, but the scientists working on the project still haven't given up hope. The Woolly Rhinoceros Bringing back an extinct animal to life is as difficult as it sounds. There's a lot of factors that do need to go hand in hand in order for de-extinction to be possible, and that's why not all extinct animals can be brought back to life. Yeah, sadly Jurassic Park lied to you a little bit there. However, for the woolly rhinoceros, all factors seem to be already in place. The most important thing that scientists need for resurrecting long-dead animals is viable DNA, and that's where Sasha comes in. Sasha is a baby woolly rhino that was found in August of 2020, frozen in the permafrost. The fossil was found with a fully intact fur, coat, hooves, and internal organs, giving scientists a crucial puzzle piece on the anatomy. More importantly though, they have an abundance of perfectly preserved DNA. It'd probably take years for the DNA to be fully mapped, which is another requirement for de-extinction, but once that's done, it's possible through gene editing techniques to alter the DNA of a modern day rhino so that baby woolly rhinos could be produced. Of course, I'm oversimplifying things, the process involved is infinitely more complex. 
Many people, though, think that the long and arduous task is worth it just to see these once majestic creatures roam the Siberian tundra once again. The Arosh Next on our list is a species of ancient bovine called the Arosh. These animals roamed Europe for a few thousands of years until the last one died in the forest of Jakatoro in Poland way back in 1627. They were huge animals, standing approximately 7 feet tall and weighing around 1,000 kilos. Scientists have been hard at work to bring them back from the dead since 2009. European science teams are attempting to revive a version of them through breeding, and one of them is aptly named Operation Taurus. The program has selectively bred 300 cows with Arosh DNA through something called backbreeding. They selected breeds of cattle which have certain Arosh characteristics, and each generation of calves may get closer to the original Arosh as in appearances, behavior, and genetic makeup. Another one is also appropriately named the Taurus Project in Portugal, which is doing pretty much the exact same process. These animals were frequently featured in the cave paintings of our ancestors. With the two projects to bring back the Arosh going on simultaneously, it might only just be a matter of time before they take photos of these animals in real life, and not just admire them on cave paintings. The Passenger Pigeon Passenger pigeons were once so plentiful that it was estimated that they comprise up to 40% of the bird population in the U.S. That equates to up to 5 billion of these passenger pigeons in the entire U.S. before European settlers discovered America. Then in the early 1900s, they were basically extinct in the wild. Only a few pigeons that were kept in captivity at the time, so an effort was made to find and capture them in the wild. In fact, from 1909 to 1912, the American Ornithologist Union offered $1,500 to anyone finding a nest or nesting colony of passenger pigeons, but these efforts were futile. The species was then declared extinct in 1914 when the last captive specimen, a female named Martha, died in the Cincinnati Zoo. She was the last of her species at the time, but with ongoing de-extinction programs, that unfortunate title could be stripped from Martha very soon. The Revive and Restore project has been spearheading the de-extinction of the passenger pigeon, as well as other extinct animals. They're doing this by decoding DNA from extinct passenger pigeons and through biotechnology, changing the DNA code of living band-tailed pigeons to match the passenger pigeon's code. By changing enough of the code, and through tried and true conservation practices, scientists hope the new birds look and behave the same way as their historic counterparts did. If the program succeeds, we're going to be seeing the new passenger pigeons as early as 2029. The Moa Moas are large and flightless birds, easy to hunt and a good source of meat. That's why when the Polynesians occupied New Zealand in the 13th century, they were, of course, hunted to extinction. Being one of the literally hundreds of species whose extinction is caused by humans, they are a prime candidate for de-extinction. And now, after 700 years of being extinct, the mighty flightless bird may again roam the Earth. And it might happen sooner rather than later. Very recently, scientists were successfully able to assemble the first nuclear genome of one of the nine extinct moa species, that of the tiny bush moa. At first, this doesn't seem to be that big of an accomplishment as the genome is just a partial draft. However, scientists working on the project say that this was no easy task and is already a defining moment in the de-extinction attempt. With this success, they're extremely confident that the genomes of the remaining eight species of moa will be assembled soon enough. After that, the reality of seeing these giant birds alive becomes so much closer. The Ground Sloth Ground sloths are far from the sloths that we know of today, in every way possible. Ancient ground sloths were huge, more active, and more importantly, have aggressive tendencies. The biggest of the bunch, the Megatherium, could grow up to 20 feet long, longer than any land mammal living today. In fact, they more closely resemble bears rather than their modern cousins. Personally, they sound like they were positively terrifying, so why would scientists want to bring them back to life? Well, because they simply think they can. The ground sloths died out just about 8,000 years ago. Hence, there's a lot of DNA that scientists can play around with. Once mapped, they can be used as blueprints to modify modern sloth DNA, thus making ancient ground sloth babies. However, here's where scientists hit a bit of a snag. In order for these ground sloth babies to develop and be born, they need to be planted into a surrogate mother. And given that modern day sloths are but a fraction of the size of their extinct counterparts, they really are not that suitable for the job. However, scientists remain undaunted, and if there is a way to bring the ground sloth back to life, they certainly will. The Thylakine Also known as the Tasmanian Tiger, the Thylakine was a marsupial. Thus, they're more closely related to kangaroos and koalas, despite looking far more like a wolf. 
Native to Australia and New Guinea, it became extinct on the mainland 3,000 years ago, but survived on the southern island of Tasmania until human hunters, who were trying to protect their livestock, drove it to extinction in the early 20th century. The last known thylakine died in Hobart Zoo in 1936, but the species may have survived in the wild until at least the 1940s. The species was then finally declared extinct in 1982. In 2008, a researcher at the University of Melbourne named Dr. Andrew Pask published a paper detailing how his team extracted DNA from a preserved thylakine and injected a portion of the COL2A1 gene, which regulates bone development, into mouse embryos, which then grew normally. This was the first time DNA from an extinct animal performed its intended function in a living animal. The experiment has renewed scientists' hopes of eventually restoring the thylakine from extinction. Then, in 2017, scientists were finally able to sequence the animal's entire genome, making the possibility of bringing the thylakine back from extinction that much closer to reality. The Irish Elk Calling this animal an elk is actually a bit of a misnomer, because despite its resemblance to modern elks, DNA analysis has revealed that it was actually a deer. In fact, it's the largest deer to have ever existed. Its antlers alone measured about 12 feet across. It lived in the icy north along with its more famous Ice Age contemporaries, such as the woolly mammoth and the woolly rhino. So when they died out, a lot of them were frozen solid in the permafrost, ready to be thawed out by scientists today. Some of these frozen bodies have actually been recovered, offering a tremendous amount of perfectly preserved DNA, making them perfectly viable candidates for de-extinction. How did they die off anyway? Well, there are theories like the sudden rise in global temperatures at the end of the last Ice Age. There is also this one ridiculous theory as well, well, at least ridiculous to me, that states that they went extinct because their antlers grew too big and they ended up getting stuck on tree branches. If that's true, then our understanding of evolution is way off. Now it's time for the day's best pick. Which is definitely an animal that I'd like to stay extinct. That being said though, these two pictures are obviously photoshopped. I'm pretty sure that's the Bane mask on that one animal right there. Either way, let's talk about the actual animal. The Saber-Toothed Tiger Of all the animals on this list, Smilodon, more commonly known as the Saber-Toothed Tiger, is probably the best candidate for de-extinction. They're certainly the most attractive candidate. Imagine the bidding war among zoos and nature preserves for the honor, and of course, the profit of hosting a roaring, pouncing, canine-wielding family of Smilodons. There's also a ton of available preserved DNA for this animal, mainly due to the multitude of frozen remains found in Siberia. However, there is the matter of what a successful reintroduction of the saber-toothed tiger would mean for the defenseless prey animals of the Serengeti, not to mention the already endangered big cats with which Smilodon would be in direct competition with. This dilemma involving the possibility of de-extincted animals pushing current species to extinction has always been the main argument of people against de-extinction, and I gotta say that they do have a point. It's kind of like releasing a T-Rex into a zoo. Not much is going to survive that attack. The Great Alk Penguins are only found in the Southern Hemisphere, mainly in Antarctica and the many sub-Antarctic islands. But did you know that there was once a penguin species that could be found in the Northern Hemisphere? It's called the Great Alk, and though it may only be distantly related to penguins with its black and white plumage and its excellent swimming abilities, there certainly is a striking resemblance. Until its final extinction in 1844, the Great Alk ranged across the entire North Atlantic Ocean, fishing the waters off the northern U.S., Canada, Iceland, and northern Europe, including the coast near Newcastle and northern England. The size of a medium penguin, it lived in the open ocean except for when it waddled ashore for breeding on just a few islands. There, its flightlessness made it vulnerable to human hunting and exploitation for its down that reached industrial scale. Attempts to regulate the hunting as early as the 16th century were, of course, fruitless. Last birds on an island off Iceland were gone by 1844. There are, however, a lot of preserved specimens of the bird. There's 71 skins, 24 skeletons, 75 eggs, and even some preserved internal organs and ancient fossil remains. This means that there is an abundance of DNA material to work with, making the great elk a great candidate for de extinction. The Ivory Billed Woodpecker the ivory-billed woodpecker hasn't been seen in the wild or even in captivity for quite a few decades now. Thus, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has proposed to declare the majestic bird extinct in 2022. Although the declaration hasn't been made official, and despite the numerous unsubstantiated sightings, all indications point that the bird is functionally extinct. And because announcing extinction is all but a formality, the ivory-billed woodpecker is a great candidate for de-extinction. 
The last verifiable sighting of the bird happened all the way back in 1944, but many well-preserved specimens are in museums with DNA that can be used to bring the species back. And since its extinction happened just recently, I personally feel that we owe it to the ivory-billed woodpecker to see that it takes to the skies once more. The Woolly Mammoth These Ice Age herbivores whose closest living relatives are the Asian elephants lived on several northern continents and had a thick, furry coat that protected against the extreme cold. These hairy animals went extinct about 4,000 years ago, but they've always been in the middle of the extinction conservations. Pretty understandable, given that excellently preserved mammoth remains are always being found in permafrost. However, viable mammoth DNA has proved surprisingly elusive, and there's also the matter of finding a suitable host to carry an engineered embryo. The most likely candidate would be a female Asian elephant. Perhaps most important, though, the woolly mammoth is by far the largest terrestrial candidate for de-extinction. Even a small herd would require a huge amount of territory, and might wind up knocking other plant eaters right out of the food chain. Before we move on, I've got a little challenge for you that'll take 5 seconds to complete. So here's the deal, you just leave a like on this video, smash that subscribe button and hit the notification bell, and you will get 25 years of amazing luck. Try it, it really works. The Neanderthal For now, the Neanderthal genome is an abstract string of billions of DNA letters stored in computer databases, but just what do we do with them? Well, de-extinction is no longer a fantasy, and today's technology makes it technically possible for scientists to add a human DNA until it resembles that of a Neanderthal. When that's done, it's only a matter of implanting a genetically modified fetus into a surrogate mother and wait for the first baby Neanderthal to be born in 40,000 years. But the question is, should we? Bringing back extinct animals is one thing, but doing that on an extinct human raises a lot of ethical questions. Uh, for one, the entire process will involve manipulating the human genome, and that's something we probably shouldn't be playing around with. But should the ethical question be answered, and that answer leans more towards the Neanderthal's resurrection, know that we have the ways, means, and the technology to do so. See you all next time!